How many Spotify uh, followers have we got? Oh, you, you're not going to make us guess I actually what started, we're going to be talking about. I started listening to the podcast the other day, and I was like, I don't like this guessing. I've changed it. I've changed it. I've made an executive decision. 21,000. 20, oh. 21,219? Exactly. Hell oh, yeah! Damn! Well done, Luke. Good job. Thank you. Well, I mean, I don't have anything else to say. It's just a number, isn't it? Yeah. It's a good number. It is a big number. Well, it's a bad number if it's the number of deaths in my house today. I think that's, that's actually a, a, lot. a pretty good number because your house would then be famous. It's an impressive number for a house. You can't even fit 21 people in your house. <laughs> Might even be a world record. He lives in a very, very... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Corey. I just bought that house. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and now 21,000 people have died in it, which is <laughs> really going to decrease that market value. <laughs> so the question for you all is today, Sorry. would you edit your jeans if you could? Get down to the YouTube comments and answer that question. Even if you're listening on Apple or on Spotify or wherever you listen, go to YouTube and answer the question in the comments. I do. Sometimes I rip them. Sometimes I like fray the edges they've you could, not you could, seen you I, could you could bleach your jeans if you please, want please for the love of god start the show start the start show, the show. <laughs> sorry <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jam and Luke Gutford. Adios. Howdy. Sorry. Hello, welcome. I mean. This week, we're talking about crispy jeans and seeing things. Crisper. Crispy. Crisper? Yes. Crisper. Yes, crisper. Not deep fried jeans. No. And no. seeing things. Things. I said that so it, it rhymed. It, uh, okay, yeah. right. Seeing, seeing things. things. Seeing things, yeah. So what do you think this episode might be about? Crisper? Yeah. Maybe. Cast nine. Oh. There are two parts. I'll just start. Okay, so why don't we do a little recap on crisper? What is crisper? It's a, it's a natural function of cells uh, that we have sort of used to do a thing we want it to do. Well, not all, yes, not all cells, though. Bacte so bacteria have this little this little thing called the CRISPR Cas9 complex. CRISPR mm -hmm. standing for cool, really ingenious, do that again. Do that sexy, again. no pyrotechnic robot. <laughs> <laughs> it stands for clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. So CRISPR is basically something in bacterial cells that they use to cut bacteriophages, which are kind of viruses that infect bacteria. So this is something that we've taken and we've said, ah. You CRISPR finds specific parts of a genome, and then it just does a little chippy chop, little little slice and dice. And the idea is that essentially, in bacteria, uh, when they're being infected by a bacteriophage, basically a virus for bacteria, um, it'll chop up the genome of the bacteriophage, and the bacteriophage won't be able to do anything. It'll be like, oh no, my my genome has been chopped up. I am useless, right? Uh, and so we saw that, and we were like, hmm, maybe we could use this to chop things. That we want to chop. So what you do is basically... It's a knife! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it is. A, basically, it's a genetic knife. But it's it's a, a genetic knife that is very specific to sp specific sequences. So what you could do is program it and say, okay, this sequence, you chop here and mm -hmm. you chop there. And that's very useful for us because w why do you think that's useful? If you want to chop. Yeah, stuff you don't want. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, gene editing, for, really. Mm -hmm. You could say, ah... This is this is this you don't is want it. Chop we, it. Yeah, we do know that bit. By the way, we just we're just playing with you. It's like with me editing. If I if I don't want a bit in the video, I just go chop. And then you shout CRISPR and loudly. Chop, and then I go, this is basically CRISPR. And but I delete it. Imagine if you were video editing. <laughs> Instead of having to look, you know, it, it, what you could do is just have something that's set up to automatically chop around specific parts. You know, for example, if we were to do this. Sorry, this is confusing for you, Jamp. But if we were to do this, if I if you had a little CRISPR editing thing, whenever you whenever it saw this, it'd be like, aha, chop. And it chopped. I have a thing that chops every time I cut the camera. So that's what CRISPR is. It's this little thing that we've taken from bacteria that chops up DNA specifically at specific points, right? It can it can find a part of a gene or a genome and be like, whoop, I'm gonna chop here. Which is fantastic, very useful. Um, and we'll get more to that in a second. We've got a whole episode on CRISPR. Do you remember what episode it was, champ? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. I didn't check either. So no. go looking through Sorry. all the episodes and you'll maybe land on it. Um I want to tell you a little bit about uh, labor congenital amaurosis. Have you heard of that before? No. No. No, I would not have expected you to because I had not heard of it either. It's a congenital eye disease that um, mostly affects your retinas. Do you guys know what the retina is? Yes. 
What is the retina? It's the back of the, the eye that picks up yes, the light. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and only affects people who work as well. I mean, it's labor congenital. L, l-, l- e b e r. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, only, only people affects, who work for the labor party. The labor party. Yeah, that's no. really interesting. Tories are safe. L e b e r yeah. congenital amaurosis. <laughs> so um, it's this congenital um, eye disease that affects your um, retina. Congenital meaning that it's it's um, ge- it's a sort of genetic thing. Um, now, essentially, um, there's a lot of different things that come along with this. Um, your uh, your your retinas are not you, they don't deal with light normally. So you can have uh, a lot. You can have like quite severe visual impairment. Um, people that have this are uh, like they're eyesight degrades from infancy mm. and they're usually legally blind um they can also have photophobia which is not a fear of light it is not a fear of light it's a fear of photos no <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, only makes sense it is an abnormal reaction to um light so your your eyes they, their eyes have an abnormal reaction to light um and their um eyes have involuntary movements um they can have extreme far sightedness um they can also have like an oddly shaped cornea. Um, apparently, they also can like like rub their eyes a lot. Like, I think this is probably usually in infants, but like they rub their eyes a lot. You know, like with their with their knuckles, with their hands, um, which is called uh, <clears throat> Frankenchetti's ocular digital sign. That was yeah, um, well, just rubbing your eyes is called yeah. poking, pressing, and rubbing the eyes with a knuckle or finger. Hmm, I do that sometimes. Yeah, yeah. but you, <laughs> I'm Frankenstein. I, I, you do not have L. C A. No, I don't. No, you no, don't. <laughs> so there are different subtypes. Um the subtypes are caused by different um mutations from different genes. Um and a lot of these are caused by a single a, a point mutation on a gene. And a point mutation, do you know do you have any guess what a point mutation might be? A mutation of one letter? Yeah, basically like a single oh. like a single a single point. point. Single point, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um now they can have different patterns of vision loss, different eye, eye, eye like eye abnormalities, um, and the treatment generally um, for all of these sort of things is trying to correct the farsightedness and using sort of vision aids where possible. But that's not obviously that's obviously not always possible. These people are generally uh, sort of legally blind, um, as opposed to legally blonde, illegally blind. Mm, that too. Yeah. It's illegal. Get him. Get him. <laughs> so criminally blind. <laughs> the symptoms um, we've kind of gone through, um, but what I want to what I want to talk about a little more um, is kind of the, the percentage of people that have these symptoms, just so you get an idea. So eighty to ninety nine percent of people have um, abnormal sort of pigmentation in their retinas. Um, abnormal um, sort of. Um, Sorry, how many percentage? Eighty to ninety nine. Of people who have this disease. Yeah, yeah, of this disease. Oh, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Not of all, of all people. <laughs> if, 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 80 to, if 80 to Sorry. 99% of people had abnormal ret- retinal pigmentation, it would not be abnormal. Yeah, yeah. it'd be quite normal. Yeah, the 1% would be, percent would be freaks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You got one color in your eye? Ugh. Weird. Um, they have a, they, uh, again, this is, this is still 89, 80 to 99% of people with um, LCA have um can have abnormal um optic discs severely reduced visual visual acuity and um marked vision impairment and 30 to 79 30 to 79 percent of people with um uh this this disorder can have um um an abnormality of neuronal migration and a abnormal electro retinogram basically um the tests used to look at your retinas and stuff they can, they can show up abnormal. what is neuronal migration the move of neurons. Really? Mm. I have no idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, this is not. Well, sometimes when I say you things, you could tell me anything. And sometimes, I look, sometimes when I say things on the podcast, I'm not like I don't go like digging <laughs> deeply into what these things are. Yeah. Sometimes if there's just a list of symptoms, I'll be like, okay, this is a list of symptoms because we're just scooting through this. Yeah. I'll hop on. But Luke is great because Luke wants to know. <laughs> What everything I do. Seen. Well, I just, I just, because what it sounds like, neuronal migration, like the movement of neurons around the brain, it's like, I didn't know neurons could move. I thought they had fixed positions or at least fixed positions relative to each other. So that's really interesting if that's the case. I think neuronal migration, it is a fundamental process in central nervous system development. Um, the assembly of functioning your neuronal circuits relies on neural migration occurring in the appropriate spatiotemporal pattern. Um, basically, if your neuromigration, neuron, neuronal migration, that's a hard thing to say, doesn't work properly, you could have a neurological disorder. So it's basically how the um, sort of central nervous system develops. 
Right. Right. Yep. Okay. An abnormality of the development of the central nervous system, resulting in some kind of neurological condition. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank Makes you. Sense. No worries. Uh, <clears throat> so, what causes labor congenital amaurosis? Now, it's uh, mutations in at least, it, it, basically a mutation in at least 14 genes that we know of so far. It doesn't need to be all 14. Um, there's just 14 genes um, that can cause this disorder due to a mutation. Um, all of them are necessary for normal vision, um, and they all do different things in the retina. Um, but like, you know, some of them are, nor some of them sort of uh, cause the development of photosensitive cells, like the, photo the photoreceptors in your retina. Other ones are um, important for phototransduction, which is when uh, the light that comes into your eye is turned into electrical signals that your brain can understand. Um, there's there's basically lots of different things that happen on your retina these uh, sort of genes can be sort of responsible for. Mm -hmm. Now, a mutation in any of those genes can uh, could be associated with um, LCA. Now, there are, I'll just, I'm going to rattle off some gene names for you. They're going to come up later, but you don't need to remember exactly what they are. Um, so it's mutations in CEP290, CRB1, GUCY2D, and RPE65 are the most common causes of the disorder. Um, and there's other, obviously, as, as I said, like there's 14 of them that we know of, um, but the other ones um, account for like a, a much smaller sort of proportion of, of sort of cases. Um, and in about 30% of all people with this disorder, the actual sort of cause is unknown. What? Yeah. So they don't have any of those gene mutations? Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. That's why we say at least 14. Wow. Yeah. Um, and it's and it can be inherited. So it's usually autosomal recessive. Do you guys know what that might mean? So you have to have two copies of the same gene from, from both of your parents in yeah. order to get it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so that oh. makes it less likely, which is nice. Which means that if you have it, you don't necessarily pass it on to your child as well. No, which exactly. Is it doesn't. So nice. Yeah. Um, but that means that if you've got two parents that are carriers, they can pass it on to their kid without without knowing about it. And you know, it's very rare as well. It's a very rare yeah, disease. Yeah, true. Um, and um, you know, uh, some of them there is one. What is it? There is one of the genes uh, that is. A, it is a dominant thing. It is autosomal dominant. I think that is a CRX or IMPDH1 genes. If you've got a mutation on those, that is a dominant. So you will that is that is dominant characteristic. So you'll pass that on um, if you have two copies of it. So you'll, your kids will definitely have it. Um, but if you've only got sort of one copy of it, then your kids might not have it. There's like a 50-50 chance. 50. Yeah, exactly. So the most common mutation causing um, this sort of um, causing LCA is IVS26, which is changes an A to a G. Um, on uh, like obviously on one of those genes, um, and it's uh, basically it's a mutation that results in the sort of non-functionality of the CEP290 protein. Exactly. Of course. Right. This is this is all this, like, you don't need to remember what the, exactly what these gene names and whatnot are. Okay. But just know that they're different things, right? Quick, why quiz is coming up? I'm remembering. <laughs> As hard as I maybe, can. Maybe, maybe. Um, so that is that is LCA. That's uh, Leber congenital amaurosis. Basically, it's an eye disorder that um, results from uh, mutations in in certain genes in your retina, and it can, in, in quite a number of cases, be caused by a single mutation. Like one of the most common ones is caused by a single mutation of a single base pair um, in a single gene, right? Which just goes through how important some of the proteins in your eyes are, that uh, in your retinas are. That like one one change. Can um can cause such a sort of massive loss of like visual um ability, and in fact, uh, I think this is this is the case of like essentially what happens there is the this this a changing to a g basically says stop, right? So it changes um it changes the sort of sequence from, you know, like I'll put this this amino acid that amino acid that amino acid that amino acid then keep on going, it goes this amino acid that amino acid that that amino acid stop. So that basically the the sort of protein is finished early mm. and it's not the full protein. Right. All of that, bear that in mind. We're going to be moving on to something else. We're going to talk about AAVs super briefly. Adeno-associated viruses, which are essentially things that we use um, for gene therapy. They're little viruses, very little viruses that can just go into you, do a little bit of gene therapy, right? And what like, do you mean by gene therapy? We so gene therapy is basically altering your it's basically altering your genes in a therapeutic sense. So this is a different thing to CRISPR Cas9 that can do. A, it's not a different. This is okay. a so this is a way of getting into this is a way of getting into sort of cells, right? So you use it as a sort of vector, which means basically you whatever sort of gene therapy you want to do, you 
basically put it in you can put it into this virus and the virus will take it into the um take it into the cells that you want to put it into and the way that it works because obviously viruses what they do is they use your cells um sort of apparatus to make stuff to make their own sort of genetic code so what you could do is it's the same it's quite similar to the mrna virus uh, the mnra mrna vaccines that we've got right now um wherein these mrna vaccines uh, you sort of basically put mrna into a cell mm -hmm. and the cell starts to make this make this thing so in the case of the mrna vaccines for covid what they do is um the mrna it is uh used in your cell to make the spike protein so your body's like oh i've got a covid spike protein cool great now i now i know how to defend against this right yeah so in this case these viruses go in and they basically you can make them to do whatever you want um and so we use them essentially for in vivo gene therapy um in vivo, in vivo meaning, meaning sort of in the body rather than in vitro which mm -hmm. would be in a sort of test tube or in a sort of petri dish or whatever right so um a lot of the sort of um the gene therapy that we've done up until this point has been you take cells out of the body you mess with them in the lab you change their um you change their genes and you put them back into the body yeah right so what i want to talk to you about today is something that is slightly different to this specifically about um this eye disease in that for the first time ever we have used CRISPR inside someone's body. We have used oh. it to actually edit genes inside a person's body. Is this recent? Therapeutically. Um, in the past couple of years. The, the, okay. So the clinical trial, well, it, it, the clinical trial, I think, started in um, 2018, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it was first submitted in 2018. It, um, and it was kind of started, I think, in 2019. And it's running until 2024. So this is super recent. Like the, the actual results of this clinical study haven't actually come out yet mm. they did some sort of um they presented them i think uh they presented preliminary results at a sort of conference and they've kind of it's kind of been out in the media but there is not like a sort of paper to look at from this yet because it's still in progress but we'll get to that in a second so essentially what, what has happened before like the only fda approved treatment for lca is um lux turner which is a viral gene therapy that uses aav like an adeno associated virus which we just spoke about um to correct a gene in your cells but what it does is it basically inserts uh, a new gene so you've got a faulty gene and what it does is it says here's a new one and so you've got both genes running so you're still producing that like protein that doesn't work you're just also producing the protein that does work at the same time right um and this is like the only the only uh, treatment for this disease. But can you maybe figure out like with all these mutations why this um, why this sort of treatment might not be um, the best? Because you're still producing the faulty one. Well, you're still producing the faulty one. But the fact is that it, it, because it's because there are like 14 different genes that this yeah. can affect. This only this only helps with one of those sort of causes. So it doesn't cure all. It doesn't like sort oh, of you right. can't use it to treat anyone with lca you only use it to treat people with lca that have this one That's very specific, specific type yeah. yeah and the issue is that um the reason i, I, I spoke about aevs that you know um associated viruses is because they're very small and the limit to the amount of sort of genes that you can sort of the limit to the sort of base pairs or sort of nucleotides the size of the genes that you mm -hmm. sort of um use with them it, it, it's it's limited right it's 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 kind of small because they are small themselves so you can't um you can't actually use just an aav on its own to fix different genes um that cause this disorder right so for example um the most common the most common cause of this disorder the the number of nucleotides the number of bases the size of the gene that you would need to use is just far too big for an aav so what they've decided to do is use crispr to fix this instead so what they've done is they've got an a they've got uh they've got the, this virus they've taken they're programmed CRISPR, sort of, uh, they're programmed CRISPR sort of um, like gene, I guess, and put it into this virus. So the virus then takes it into the body and lets CRISPR go loose. Does that make sense? Somewhat. Okay. I'm on. struggling to follow the multiple layers here. We've got AEVs, right? We've got these, these got, we've got these viruses that we use for some gene therapy. And they mm -hmm. sort of smuggle things into the body, exactly. into the cells. Exactly. Are they able to smuggle CRISPR into the cells? Yeah, that's what they're doing with it. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. We've never done that before. Right. And this is the first time that we've done this. We've basically put CRISPR into a cell. Um, and inside, uh, into a cell inside someone's body whilst they're still alive and kicking. And we mm -hmm. So we had done that before, but we'd only done it in vitro. We'd never, so we had, we'd put it in, we'd put CRISPR into cells before, but yeah, only in vitro. In a petri dish. 
Yeah. And so you've got this virus that it basically acts as the way of getting CRISPR into the body, into the cells, and then lets CRISPR out, and then CRISPR can then do the actual gene snipping and gene editing. Exactly. And the, th the thing with this... And that's the only thing that virus does, sorry. The only thing that virus does for us... Is just is to is get yeah. smuggles things in. Just put, put things in, yeah. Right. Exactly. And what CRISPR is doing in this case is what, what's really interesting is often what we do with CRISPR is we use it to make a chop and then add something else in. But because this one point mutation is essentially... It, it's, it's, it's a point mutation. It's this, one single, it's this one single thing. What we can do is we can just chop out the faulty gene. The single letter. Yeah, we can we, we, we basically chop that out. And then it just starts working again. So you don't have that. Um, you don't have the faulty protein being produced. You've just basically chopped out the bit that causes the problem, and the cells can then produce the proteins that they need to. And you don't have to replace oh. it with the correct letter. No, you don't need to. You don't need to replace anything in this case. No, that's really and interesting. So, what, so then, but that, does that not then mean that the letter, the letter we want to be there, isn't actually doing anything? Not necessarily. It, it, genes are a little bit more complex than that. Okay. I, I won't get into it too deeply, but the fact is that you can essentially just make the chop. Yeah, and the gene will work properly, the way right. that they, the way they've cut it, as opposed to having to add something in or have like the the faulty gene still be there. You can just make this one change, and boom! Suddenly, your the cell the cells in the retina are able to produce this sort of um mm. this protein again. And this has worked. And how many people has this worked? So not many people <laughs> Sorry, is that so far. We haven't done it in many people, yeah. or in most people. Yeah, it's no. unaffected. No, 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 no. It's not. It's we've not done it on many people yet. So I think we've. Th there's 18 people in this trial. 18 patients in this trial. Um, and I think so far I only know about I think six or so of them that have had that have actually sort of gone through it. Mm, like, yeah. I've only got sort of data on I think maybe about six of them. Um, and it has worked on. It's worked on a few of them. I'm not sure the exact numbers. Um, I have it somewhere, mm -hmm. but I can't see it. <laughs> okay. Um, it, but it didn't. It didn't work on all of them. Is is the thing? It worked on a, a good number of them. And at all, least two. And all these eighteen people, or at least these six people, they've all. So I, I'm assuming what you've said earlier is uh, applies here, which is that this fix only works for people with a very with with the one specific gene mu mutation. It doesn't work on all, all fourteen. Yeah, it doesn't work on all. But this one. So there, there were two different ones, right? So it was one that they used that just uh, that added in a new gene, right? Yeah. Um, and that worked for like one specific one. And this one also mm -hmm. works for one specific one, but it just so happens that this one specific one is the most common one. And okay. I assume mm -hmm. that all these people in this trial have that one yeah, specific yeah, 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 one. Yeah, 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 have yes. that one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it hasn't worked on some of those people. That's so interesting. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously quite complex, right? It sounds very simple, but what we're doing is we're injecting this into someone's retina. Um, and... There are a lot of problems that could happen, you know, between the correct gene being there and the correct pro pro uh, proteins being produced. For example, the retinal cells could have degraded to the point where there's not enough to give back mm, any significant right. amount of sight. But it is really, really interesting. So um, essentially what, what has happened kind of before this is that we've kind of used CRISPR to treat things, well, not to necessarily treat things, but we've, yeah, we've kind of used it as, it's like sort of therapeutically before. And as I've said, this has always been out of the body. So what's cool about this is that you can literally just, for the first time ever, inject something into someone's eye, and they get they start getting vision back. And the reason yeah. that we can't do the reason that we couldn't do any of this before with retinas is because you can't really remove retinal cells and then put them back in. Too delicate. Uh, yeah, probably something like that. Yeah, I don't know exactly why, but probably something like that. Probably as well. That like okay, so for example, if it was blood cells, easy. Because you just put them back in the you blood. Just don't, back in right <laughs> you know there's, there's lots of like, liver yeah. cells as well you could take them out put them back in there's lots of different cells that you could take out and put back in but yeah retinal cells are really difficult to do that with so let's just quickly go through sort of the trial and what's going on with the trial um there is it, it, like i said as i said it was first submitted october in 2018 um and they're still working on it they're planning on, to work on it until i think may of 2024 so we've not finished this trial yet um we do know, like after four weeks of having injected this, basically the stuff into their eye, they're injecting it only into one eye, by the way. So they've got the test eye, mm. because obviously, if there's if there's any dangers with it, like this is being used to understand dosage and stuff as well. Um, they basically injected it in one eye, and after four weeks, they'd be able to find out if there's any vision that's come back. Um, and basically, once CRISPR got into those cells, it went in, it cut out the mutation that was causing the the disease, and some people's sight started to come back in really interesting ways. I've got some stories here for you um, in a second. But what, before we get into that, I do need to say that, like, obviously, 
this is not this isn't like oh we have absolutely cured this this is a trial this is a clinical trial that hasn't even finished yet right. so um they always need to be treated for longer and to like you know we need to see that it's safe that it, there's not going to be any issues with it so we need to continue looking at this for quite a while um and it says there it's far from curing um patients in the trial um but the changes are significant enough that it's actually changed their daily lives right wow because if you if they've gone from not being able to see very much at all yeah they're now able to like see more like basically they've got more like cells in their eyes even basic vision exactly would be really good yeah so it, the thing is as well what's really what must be really frustrating about this is that they've got different because i said they were working on doses they've got different patients with different doses so they they've got some patients on lower doses and some patients on patients on higher doses and um the, obviously this is changing like, huh. the difference of the doses. Yeah, changing how much, like the yeah. test with aspirin when they were like trying to work if aspirin works for reducing was it aspirin i think we were trying to work out if aspirin helps reduce heart attacks or something like that and then basically the results were so overwhelming that they stopped the study and went right we need to give everyone aspirin because yeah. it works so well <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> um, but but it, also that is so just quickly to check the different doses are um in order to see the effective what what level is effective it's not because the people are for example larger people or have different size it's, eyes or to see what's safe and what's effective yeah, yeah. so it, it's both of those it's basically uh to figure out did we give this are they gonna get ill yeah are we gonna do something mm. wrong is it gonna hurt, good hurt to them? check that stuff it's yeah, probably maybe. good to check it yeah but i mean but yeah not very nice if you're stuck on a dosage that doesn't work and you're like i want to see something please yeah <laughs> can you just give me a bit more yeah exactly exactly <laughs> um so i mean um, I, I need to say as well, none of the people that have got this have achieved what what's what it says there as normal vision. Like they've not gotten sort of full vision back. They're still, I think they're still all legally blind. But they, as I've said, there's enough of a change there that they have impacted. Like mm. their daily lives have been impacted. So I'll just tell you, I've got uh, two two of the the people in the in the sort of trial spoke to NPR. So I've got the kind of interviews that they gave there. So one of them's called Carly Knight. She said that apparently she couldn't even. Um, she she works in a sort of call center. She couldn't get around the call center using a cane. She was bumping into cubicles and really scaring people that were sitting in them. Mm. She said, um, and since then um, she's she's improved enough to make make it out of doorways, get through hallways, <gasps> wow. see objects, and even colors, which is insane. Imagine yeah. going from like having to use the sort of like the sort of the cane to help you sort of navigate your way around to being able to like see color, li literally walk, like see color and walk yeah. through a door. Um, she said it, her vision is much clearer and brighter since the treatment. Um, and instead of having to reach around blindly for objects, she can just look for them. Which, mm. I mean, again, we all take sight for granted. Like it's one of the, it's it's the dominant sense, or rather, we think of it as the dominant sense because we rely on it so much. Yeah, and because our brain, so much of our brain is dedicated to processing it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. which is, I mean, I mean, again, the, why we rely on it so much. Mm. Well. Or which way is it? Do you think? Well, if if so much of your brain is dedicated to processing it, then it, it it has some kind of advantage. Otherwise, the cost would not outweigh the the benefit would not outweigh the cost. So yeah, we're so reliant on it. Be, uh, we're so reliant on it because it's very beneficial to us, but also because we've built a world that requires you to see. Mm. So like, it's a bit of both. Isn't yeah, it? exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, and that, that's the thing though. We don't. We take it for granted. We don't think about maybe even that sort of limited like just being able to see a doorway or see some color how going from not being able to do that to being able to do that would be such a massive step up because i feel mm -hmm. like for a lot of people listening to this like they might be thinking oh but they haven't got their f like full vision back so what's the what's the point yeah what well, well no that's not i mean that's not how i've eyes evolved no eyes evolved because any sight is more helpful than no sight yeah, yeah. exactly absolutely <laughs> Um, and she said, this, an example here, she said, um, she dropped a fork on her kitchen floor and she just leaned down to pick it up um, <gasps> and didn't know where it was and just saw it on the floor. That it's must very be cool. like so surprising. Is, it's just very after, cool. She's like, hang on, what just happened? This is a superpower. It feels like <laughs> when astronauts go to space and gravity and just- they leave things. Yeah, well, yeah. The <laughs> gravity just isn't there anymore. And you're like, oh, oh, <laughs> I don't see. Like, I- things will just not fall. It's really cool. funny that you say a superpower. I once watched a YouTube uh, series by a blind guy talking about what it was like being blind. And he was saying that, um, he's like, the idea that you can, you know someone is like walking towards you before you've made, before they've made any sound 
it's like you guys have a superpower and you have yeah. no idea and it's just like yeah if you imagine the things that sight allows you to do like you know an object is there when it's not making a sound mm. like to somebody who doesn't have has never had sight that would be a really weird thing like how they wouldn't they might not even be able to comprehend how you would even go about that or what mm. like let alone like imagining what sight would be like mm. you can estimate the weight of an object based on how it's moving yeah, yeah. right how, like, how yeah. quickly it slows down and stuff right like it's yeah. and like obviously you can estimate that based on like the sound like you can say oh like if it's I, making low frequencies yeah. yeah i know roughly how heavy this iphone that i just dropped on the desk is but like you can also see that just by watching a thing move yeah mm. it's so wow yeah sight weird. is interesting right it's weird. very yeah. But I mean, it's not, I guess it's not just sight. It's the fact that the way that your brain processes it as well. Yeah. Right. We talked about that in the last, in like, I don't know what order the episodes come out in, but the episode with um, Balan Jalal, um, we talked about how the brain has um, like a good model of how physics works, like mm. to the point where you can learn things in your mm. sleep that require you to understand physics. Um, yeah. Just so weird. So that's what you're saying there. It's mm. like you can observe an object and infer its possible weight from from seeing it like that's a strange thing that we just take for granted yeah, yeah. and it's, it's kind of what i mentioned that episode as well wherein when it's why cgi i think is so difficult yeah and also not not just that i mean okay so this was a while ago i was playing a mario game like a not, not, whether, whether it was a knockoff or a port i was playing it and mario didn't move correctly yeah the weight of mario was wrong and i i knew that yeah mario didn't feel right which is yeah. just like the fact that like my like somewhere in my brain is stored that this is how this fictional video game character moves and feels mm. to the point where if it's even just the slightest bit off, it's like you know, remember when Flappy Bird was big and there were yes. all, all the knockoff Flappy Bird games. They didn't feel right. They didn't feel right. No, they didn't have the same. They didn't. Mm -hmm. They didn't fall at the same rate no. or anything. Exactly. When Fall Guys came out on PS4, didn't feel right. Really? Yeah. Couldn't, oh, because... I couldn't play it. So weird. It's so weird how your brain just tunes into that. The uh, the Bland Ep is going to be the next one next week, I believe. So look forward to that. That's a little sneak peek. Little Spoilers. Sneaky, Spoilers. Sneaky My apologies. Luke, you can see into the future now. Yeah, man. I opened my third eye. Have you opened yours? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> She's stubborn. So Carlene Knight, she's 55. Um, uh, she lives in Portland, Oregon. Um, she dyed her hair green. Which was her well, favorite color? You were gonna say she Is died. It... No, it was no, like, no. She died. She dyed her hair, her green. hair green. Okay, good. Happy ending. To celebrate because she's able to see green now. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's nice. She said it's kind but of fun to see. She's also presumably able to see um, the color of her hair naturally, and she was like, "Nah, not for me." Well, no, green was her green is her favorite color. Uh, so she was like, "I'll dye it green." Green is her favorite color now. I think she had some sight as a kid. Oh, okay, right. Because it's degenerate. Oh, it's de okay. it, it, you lose it. I see. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, that's she so remembered. Sad. She remembered green. I like green. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or she saw it and she was like, "Oh yeah." Oh yeah, green. I remember that now. <laughs> uh, I've also got Michael uh, Calberer. Calberer. Calber. Why are these such difficult, difficult names? I've got Mike. Um, got Mike. So he was another uh, person in the experiment. He can see color for the first time in years, and apparently about a month after the. You know, he first got the injection. Um, a red car drove past and he spotted it. And he was like, wow, that's red. That happened. Well, yeah, no, but I mean, uh, imagine, yeah, like, oh. imagine not seeing color for like a decade and then suddenly seeing a red car. To everyone else, it's just like another thing to I, see. I feel like these moments, I, don't, I, can't, I can't give you a specific example, but I feel like these moments are like, if you've ever had moments where like you notice something and then you realize that you just noticed a thing that you haven't noticed for a while, mm. right? You don't notice it whilst you're observing it. You notice it just afterwards and then you reflect back on go, oh, wow, I treated that as a normal thing, but that's not a normal thing now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It's like when I quit my job after a while and I was like, oh, I can just do what I want. Yeah. Cool. Sometimes that's I don't realize that. I'm like, hmm, nice. <laughs> that's cool. That's really cool. <laughs> But yeah, like the first time that you realize like, oh, wait, I don't need to wake up at 8 a.m. Uh, yeah. Or, you know, I still occasionally wake up and I'm like, oh, God, I've got to go to school. And I'm like, oh, I haven't felt that in so long. <laughs> wow. That was a whole horrible thing I had to deal with for most of my life. Right? Yeah. It's horrible. Why do they do that to kids? Uh, yeah. I don't know if that was I don't know if that was because of school being like a thing I didn't like because I didn't have a good time at school or if it was a thing that's like just the fact, the idea of having to do something that you don't necessarily want to do. Yeah. 
Like it's probably one a bit of both. You're being beheld to it against you. Yeah, mind. like compelled activity yeah. and also uh, not a nice experience yeah. for other reasons. So Michael Kelber, he went to his cousin's wedding. Um, he was the one that saw the red car. So he went to his cousin's wedding and he said, I could see the DJ strobe lights change color and identify them to my cousins who were dancing with me. That was a very, very fun, joyous moment. No. I think honestly, like reading these, it's just like, Oh yeah, and like seeing see, being able to see stuff is really cool. We we genuinely do take a lot of this for granted. And I take when, too much for granted, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Think about all the colors you're seeing right now. The purple. Yep. The well, side guy's purple. I think it's what's interesting to me is that I think that sight is sight is really kind of overwhelming to an extent. It could be really really overwhelming because it's it's not really something you can turn off. Yeah. Right. You know, like yeah. you can plug your ears, and it's kind of it's kind of. You, know, you can not really hear very much, and that's fine. Yeah. But even when you close your eyes, you're still seeing things. Yeah, the way, the way I put this in perspective is, this might be a niche reference, but um, if you think about the size of an uncompressed audio file, and then think about the size of an uncompressed video file. Now, you may have come across an uncompressed audio file in normal everyday life very occasionally, but you will never come <sighs> in contact with an uncompressed video file no. because they are monstrous. I had to submit my film as an uncompressed video file and it was so big that it would take two days to upload over my internet. So I had to put it on a hard drive and drive it there because it's like <laughs> 500, 600 gigabytes. Oh yeah. Just, my, uh, just an, one uncompressed film. So think about like an hour and a half of sight, right? Which is my film. At like not even like a massive like your eyes are probably higher resolution than this is 600 gigabytes which is 600 oh, i don't even know like trillion bits of information for an hour and a half like it's a ludicrous amount of information so yes of course it's overwhelming it's um, so much data but the processing that you do on that data when this is what baffles me constantly mm. that everything that's in my field of view right now i can identify and my brain is doing it like it, it's kind of you like don't have to try filtering it out. It just, it's, just, it. it's just doing it automatically. Like, yeah. and whenever, whenever I think about this, it stresses me out because suddenly, instead of just like filtering out all of the things that I've identified, my brain is like saying, "Oh, those are sound panels. That's Luke. Those are headphones. That's Jamp. That's microphone. That's T-shirt. Stop." <laughs> <laughs> so don't want to know all of. I don't. Ah, it's so frustrating. Like right now, it's too much. Just try and doing that. Just don't try do it right now. No. Whatever you're doing right now, just look and try and just, just tell yourself to just analyze everything. Just like think about what everything is called. It's like when you accidentally and trigger the screen reader on your iPhone and it reads out like a text <laughs> to you or a tweet or yeah. something. And, and it just like, doesn't end. Oh God, it just goes on forever. <laughs> or like when you realize that your tongue's too big for your mouth or that you can control your breathing. No, you know? why, why would you do that? What? you got to control your own breathing and that your tongue doesn't fit no, comfortably no, in your no, mouth? No, no, shut up about the tongue. Your eyes are itchy. No, they're not. Yes, they are. Manual no. blinking mode. But your head? Oh, my head is itchy. Is your head itchy? Mine isn't, what no. if I say nits? No. Or head lice. I no. just I just think no? of the smell no. of tea tree shampoo because that's how my mum used to wash nits when there was an outbreak at school. Why would she wash the nits? How many outbreaks? <laughs> Get them all individually and bathe them. <laughs> <laughs> Tuck them into bed. <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs> They're eggs. What are you washing them for? <laughs> Shiny. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he also um, he also saw a sunset. Uh, for the first time in ages, and apparently that was a great moment. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of a general overlook of this sort of therapy, which is really really cool. Like I cannot overstate to you how incredible it is that we've managed to get to a point right now where we are able to inject gene therapy into people's bodies yeah. using CRISPR. We've injected gene therapy into people's bodies before, um, as I said, using those um, uh, using those AAVs, those adeno associated viruses. But the issue with those is, as I said that they're small and you've got a limit on how large that basically the thing that you, sorry. But the issue with those, as I said, is that they're small. You've got a limit on how much information you can sort of change, right? Whereas with CRISPR, you can, you can basically set it up to only cut at a certain point. It gives you a, a much, much bigger sort of range that mm. you can um, sort of work with, right? Because basically what CRISPR does is it just finds uh, a sequence and says, okay, I'm going to chop at this sequence, right? Which yep. means that you don't need to, you don't, wouldn't need to um, sort of put the whole sequence into the actual virus. You could just say, hey, CRISPR, chop at this bit. And it's roughly, it, 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 it doesn't take up that much sort of space in the virus. Do you know what I mean? Like sort of yeah. data space, which is incredible. 
But I do want to talk about before we sort of um, before we sort of move on, are some potential issues with this? Do you think maybe some potential issues that might come up with putting um, just injecting CRISPR into someone's body? It, this is something I've wondered actually since we first talked about CRISPR. Is there ever the risk that the sequence it's targeting occurs twice in the genome? So yeah, off-target mutations. That's exactly what we're talking about there. Um, essentially, if you've got a sequence that shows up twice in the genome, CRISPR doesn't know, doesn't care. It no. just, it, it's not like, oh, I know, it, it just chops that sequence. So chop, chop, chop. And what? Like looking at the reference picture, like, yeah, yeah, you fit. Yeah. yeah I'm taking you. CRISPR is like a racist Sorry. cop. If you're yeah. black, you're going in. But um, um, it doesn't. Yeah, you look pretty similar. <laughs> <laughs> Close enough. Well, I mean, what is the issue? Like, what, what might happen if you chop in the wrong place? You mess up a different protein. Exactly. Make some other problem for yourself. Exactly, yeah. And this could also end up causing cancers, potentially, as well. You know, if you think about it, you know, if you've got a gene that kind of protects you from getting cancer and you snip that, oh boy. Oh, God. Is she coming, right? Yeah. You, you want to be careful with, with what you're doing. So... Um, what, what they've said, I've got a quote here. It says, rare off-target edits that are made to sequences that have no function or that disrupt an essential cer cellular function, causing a tiny fraction of cells to die, in my opinion, are not likely to be clinically significant. And that's from David Liu, uh, PhD, who is a biochemist at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard University. Um, essentially, what he's saying there is that, look, there are going to be some off-target mutations. That's basically unavoidable. But... If they cause some cells to die and they don't really affect that much else, it's probably fine. Cool. The great are good. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, I assume I'm correct in um, assuming no. that... Oh. Double assumption. <laughs> when you assume, uh -oh. you make an ass out of you and... Okay, well, let's find out. Um, I assume <laughs> I'm correct in assuming that when you inject this um, virus carrying CRISPR in to, for example, the eyes... Um, it stays in roughly the area you've you've injected it into. It doesn't go around the body. As far yeah, as far as I'm aware, it just it's it's base, it's quite localized to the retina. Sorry, as far okay. as you're aware, so you're assuming. Ooh. Ooh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> or I'm yeah. protecting my ass. Uh, yeah, but yeah. yours is an educated assumption, whereas mine was just an assumption. Yeah, as in I think I read that, but yeah. um, I don't want to go out on a, a limit. Say it doesn't affect any other part of the body because it. it yeah, it may seep it, a little yeah, bit, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's not like um, you know, you inject it like like it's not like uh, when you eat paracetamol, for example, that goes into quite a lot. Like you get paracetamol built up in other areas other than the pain, the place you're targeting the pain. Your a lot of your body gets um, pain killed, even the parts that aren't painful. I'm not sure. So how paracetamol works is that it. Um, it goes around. It, it basically goes through your like. Um, it, you eat it. It goes through into your sort of liver bloodstream, mm. and then it goes around your body. And if if there are any of those sort of, I think I can't remember if it's the pain receptors or if it's the sort of chemicals that signal it's the pain. gap in the middle of between the recept between the synapses. But I think it's, I think it only it only does that it only does that if they're sort of active. Really, I think I think it's their specific their specific chemicals um, that are present when it's active, um, and that's what it binds to. Oh, okay. So my paracetamol was a poor example then. Yes, I think it was. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. I again, I I'm fairly sure that's how it works. Like, we can talk about it specifically at some other point, but I think it only targets receptors that are experiencing pain at that point. That's right? very interesting. Yeah. Good. Good. Good job, paracetamol. That's why you don't go. That's why you don't go completely numb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I assumed it was just targeting pain as opposed to like other senses. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, so like, data. but like when you take paracetamol, right? It can protect you from pain. Yeah. But if I flick you in the face, you're still going to feel pain. That's true. So it only targets sort of the active um, pain receptor. Present Sustained pain. pain. Well, yeah. The, well, yeah. yeah. So when you, so if you're in pain, so I, I, I assume that if you're pinching yourself, you know, about 30 minutes after you've had your paracetamol, which is when it starts, starts to get into your bloodstream, that you're, it might go there and be like, no, <laughs> stopping you, pinch. I don't know, though. We'll, we'll have to, we could do a little experiment. With Ooh. Luke and some paracetamol. So I pinch myself. Pinch you. Yeah, pinch you. Well, you, you have some paracetamol, and then after maybe about 20 to 30 minutes or so, we just we just pinch you. Yeah. We keep you being pinched, yeah. and we'll see if it stops you Yeah, from being, being But then pinched. we also have to pinch me without paracetamol for a control, which is just cruel, really. No, I think we should do, we should do that. <laughs> I think that's fine. we more pinching them, anyway, so if you're suggesting it, then yeah. Also, we should do one where you take the paracetamol, and then after, like, you know, after the amount of time is gone, 
So, okay, so here's I start what we pinching do. myself. So here's what yeah. we do. Yeah, so here's what we do. We do one where you're pinching yourself um, from the moment that you take the paracetamol. Yeah. You do one where you're pinching yourself um, after the paracetamol would have just sort of entered your system. Yeah. And we do one where you um, take it, take it um, and then after the paracetamol has entered your system, then a little while after that, you start pinching yourself. And then also where we just pinch you with no paracetamol. Okay. So four. This, so Sounds four. Fun. Four. Mm, four pinches. Okay. And, I, and all this time, I'm taking a, a dose of paracetamol I don't need to take. Well, you do need to take it if you're being pinched. You're, you're in pain, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I have, honestly, Luke, not a single clue. And yeah, okay, right. Okay, well, I mean, I'm fine. I'm down for it. Yeah, it's weird. Can I take Calpol on one of them as well? Because that tastes so good. Oh, it does taste good. Don't drink Calpol at oh, home Calpol. unless you're a sick little kid. Or you're pinching yourself. No, don't give them bad advice. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube will take us down for medical misinformation. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> Don't take Calpol unless you're in pain and you know how to take it. And you're a child. And, you're and your parents giving it to you. No. You can take Calpol if you're an adult, if you want. You probably shouldn't, though. Why not? It's just paracetamol and flavoring. No, but it's for kiddies. You take up the Calpol, the kids aren't going to get it. <laughs> Supply and demand. <laughs> but <laughs> if the adults best? demand Calpol, Calpol will be made. It'll be supplied. But it will go up in price and the kids won't be able to get it. The kids can't. Calpultalism. Anyway. Price them out the market. Calpultalism. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> what is driving this recent inflation boost? Well, Corey and Luke and all the other Psy Guys followers have been buying up all the Calpol. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, w th these off-target edits um, are not... They're not like sort of desirable but you can limit it right and obviously if you're worried about um if you're worried about the sort of off-target edits that contribute to cancer um what you could do is you could monitor those specific genes the sort of cancer associated genes during the development of a therapy right so then you if, if there's not really any change then you know okay cool we're not going to be hitting any off-target edits using this specific gene therapy because uh, we've looked at these cancer genes and it doesn't even have a huge effect on them out of interest you <laughs> two questions really firstly surely you know there's going to be off-target edits because you you can sequence the genome of the person you're putting it into first and you can tell if the area that you're targeting is repeated yeah but if you think about doing that for every single person that you're going to be giving like it's yeah you, i mean yeah. i guess you could conceivably do that and the second question is um is there a limit to the length of the genetic code that CRISPR can target because obviously the longer the code, the less likely you're going to have a second, like a, a, a miss hit. There is, so there is, yeah, there is a limit, but I can't remember what that up, that upward limit is. Mm. But ultimately, you think about how the, the sort of, you don't need that much to, you don't need to, it doesn't need to be that big to not have that many, not show up that often in a genome, yeah. right? Because there's, obviously there's the different base pairs, but like, even with like four, there's oh, still- the statistical likeliness yeah. gets- ridiculously high with only a few more mm. yeah i mean so even with four base pairs sort of like with uh, sort of a sequence of four you still got quite a lot of combinations just coming from that four then you think about eight then 16 mm. there's lots of different sequences lots of different combinations so yeah exactly um <clears throat> and there's also some like future treatments that can be used with this technology i mean obviously this blindness study is just one but apparently there's about 24 um crispr related clinical trials that have been launched around about the same time um i mean they've been they've been used to sort of uh try and treat blood disorders like sickle cell disease and something called uh beta thalassemia um there's also something called i think it's hunter's syndrome or hunter's disease um that where they it, it, i think that's something to do with uh, gosh i can't remember a specific protein specific protein or specific sort of um sugar or something in the body um and they they sort of tried to use crispr to treat that it didn't work very well but it was a good sort of um it showed that you could use crispr in that way so it, it didn't have a huge therapeutic significance but as a sort of proof of proof of concept it was fantastic um apparently it'll be like quite a while before we see any crispr sort of therapies hitting um hitting the sort of like um market i guess so you won't necessarily be getting this anytime soon but it is like it is on the horizon, which is really cool. This really specific gene therapy that you just get injected into you, and your genes are like you don't need to get them taken out and then like cultured in the lab, fixed in that way, and then put back in your body. You can just be injected with a little bit of like sort of gene editing stuff that can fix your that can like alter your genome so that it doesn't have the mutation in it anymore. Do you think we're ever going to get to the point where the hair dye industry 
comes up against uh alternative which is that you can get your hair genes altered so that you grow different color hair no why not because both of those would work in tandem well okay but because it would take yeah how long does it take for your hair to grow well yeah a few months how long does it take to dye your hair <laughs> Yeah, no, I understand that. No, no. But like, if someone wants to permanently change your, their hair, like I might have permanently changed my oh. hair when I was like twelve and getting beaten up for being ginger. I might have been like, "Yeah, go on, stick some crisper in my scalp, and we'll get this over with." <laughs> wow, that's so well, sad. I, yeah, I don't, I'm no, not saying uh, I should yeah, have done it. I'm just I saying mean, it might. Like, if I lived two hundred years from now, maybe. In that sense, yeah, I you know, I suppose people would people would could potentially do that. I mean, they might take a hit, but I I think that they're sort of flexibility of hair dyeing would still keep it around but yeah no that's a that's a fair that's an interesting point i mean contact lenses you know just yeah although i don't think that would quite work the same way but you, you know um it is it is interesting that we could be looking at a future wherein you know you just edit people's genes yeah i just wonder because like the liberalization of so many things that once were not like accepted parts of society when this becomes like super safe and sequencing everyone's genome is like takes like five minutes and it's a prick of your finger mm. which we already it already takes like 15 minutes to sequence a genome doesn't it um and you can check for all the doubles and then you just and then this is super simple shave the head inject it in a few places done like that just seems like a totally alien thing to us but like it would be a totally normal thing to them yeah i mean if you want you could probably i mean there might be something making it making you able to stimulate cell growth so that the protein is produced like the protein strand, the keratin strand for your hair yeah. is produced more quickly than normal, which is super interesting. I don't know. It's it's it, it, it you know what I mean it opens up all of these cool like sort of sci-fi ideas that are close to becoming sci-fi, sci-fi, sci-fi. Yeah, sci fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Non sci-fi, sci non fi. Yeah, sci non. Yeah. I hate that, again. We've spoken about this before. I hate that fiction <laughs> is. The, the default is the default, and <laughs> not you're a nerd, Corey. No, it yes. just seems weird that like, oh, what is what is like, what is this kind of book? Is it the is it real or not real? No, is it like not not real or is it not real? It doesn't make any sense. No, is it make believe that, or is it not make believe? That, exactly, that's my point. Is it's because you're a nerd. It's it's not. Is it not not real? It's is this a story or a not story? Is it a creation or is it a not creation? Yeah, but reality is reality. Yeah. Having the default be not reality, just plain silly, I think. I think some people prefer that. Well, clearly, well, of course you would think that. Of reading, when reading, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I exclusively listen to factual books. And so. I almost exclusively read nonfiction up until recently. So. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, fiction up until recently. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, Psy Guys has got you into reading. <laughs> Non Never fiction. read a single book for. No, I have read multiple books. Read, <laughs> hey, I've seen the accounts. You've read some books. Yeah, I read some books. <laughs> Unless you've bought the books and not read them. Oh, in which case, I'm going to be having a word with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've read. I've read quite a number of books. Um, oh, yeah. have you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and I actually read them instead of getting someone to read them to me. <laughs> oh. This episode is brought to you by Audible. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Hey, Audible, if you want to hit me up for a spot, I spend enough money with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> I mean, you can also, there was, I saw a study that was using it in cancer. Some of the patients died, but it's, um, it's still, it, the idea is still there instead of, you know, using um, CRISPR instead of chemotherapy. Um, just altering, yeah. the, altering the genome of the... Altering the cancerous genes. Yes. Mm. Could you alter the cancerous genes so they just die? I mean, you could. Yeah. I mean, you could probably just... Yeah, I mean that's well. The whole point of cancer is that it grows without dying. Yeah, and doesn't like to stop. So and ch cancer is mutated at some yeah. point, hasn't it? So if you can put in the mutation that that cancer has, mm -hmm. and you just go CRISPR, chop it. Yeah, just chop it up. Don't re it. don't replace it with anything. Just chop it up. Exactly. Yeah. And it just that's, dies. I mean, that's the idea. Obviously, it's a it's a little bit more complex than that. But really? the idea is still yeah, a little, a little <laughs> a tiny, bit. <laughs> a little bit more complex. But the idea is still there. And it's really it's really cool. This is like so interesting to me. I, I I read so much on this because it's just so cool that we can just inject this thing that can just chop up your genes and sort them out if you want them to. And what's interesting about this, I think we want, I kind of want to talk about the ethics of this at this at this point, um, because we spoke about something similar to this before and people are always worried about gene editing, particularly with sort of like sort of disabilities like um sort of Sort of blindness and you know a lot of uh, a lot of times this comes up with um sort of deaf people saying oh we don't want to have our sort of genes changed because it's sort of xyz in, in this case i think that 
it's not affecting the gametes, right? So I don't, as far as I'm aware, this is pretty much locate like uh, located mm. just with your retina. So if you are, if you are like recessive in this, you can pass it on and still technically pass on that gene, you know? Yeah. So the worries of sort of this being a case of like, oh, this kind of eugenics or something like that, it, it's it's somewhat lessened in this case. Yeah, um, we should really probably try and perfect it in people before we allow it into their gametes. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like in because you can mess up an individual person as much as you like and they can still have a baby that's not going to ha carry that messed up yeah. thing. Well, I think what's interesting with this is that there's the element of choice there as well. So, 3-year-old and up they did with this study. So there's they were doing it on kids, but the the fact is that like there's still that element of choice there. You know, because a lot of issues that people say is, oh, well, you're editing the, the genomes of embryos, so they don't have the choice to whether they want to live like this or like that. And you're kind of saying that this, like, kind of mode of life is less valuable. In this case, though, the people, like, you know, the adults that volunteered for this trial, they're adults. They can make their own decisions. They mm. want to edit their genes. They can, which is pretty fantastic, I think. Sorry, could you just clarify what you mean by there's an element of choice when you've done this experiment in three year olds? Mm, there's an element of choice um, in that the the person, the, the, like a three year old, is a person, and can choose. And obviously, the three year old. <laughs> no, no, wait, wait, listen, choose. listen, 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 yeah. listen. They the, so the the study, the sort of clinical trial, was with three year olds. I'm yeah. not saying that they, but it's not saying that it needs to be done with three year olds. But like because it's not being done on embryos, people that aren't embryos generally can make a choice. Obviously, I'm not saying that they should do it on three year olds. But of the adults in this study, they could choose. And so if this therapy yes. was to was to sort of be perfected, then it could be something that could be given to people who make the choice to get it mm -hmm. rather than something that is given to an embryo. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't saying that three-year-olds could choose. <laughs> no, I just, this is why I asked you to clarify. That's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Mammy, I've been reading up on CRISPR. <laughs> <laughs> so... I've also got a little bit about the accessibility of this. So um, this is just a quote uh, from one of the people that sort of uh, is working in this area saying that um, we don't want it to be developing CRISPR treatments that benefit only European Caucasians. So the idea is that you want to make it generali uh, generalized. You can make it sort of available to a lot of people mm -hmm. um, without having to make it very specific to someone's specific genome. Because um, um, a sort of a treatment um, which is similar to this treatment that we're looking at um, is sort of four hundred thousand dollars. Oh, um, yeah. Um, come on and hit Jess. Come on. And the and also the genetic databases that scientists use to program these edits for CRISPR are based mostly on white people. Well, yeah. it's Caucasian populations. Yeah, that's not surprising. Obviously, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> people are like, oh, science isn't science is racist. It's very racist. Not like on purpose. It's just people are racist. You know. And they're not always racist on purpose either. Oh, but they still no. are racist. Oh, the so. system is racist. Yeah, M most, most, mostly on purpose. So much racism. Well, you know how we can end it. Um, really, please give. Come on, we, we're running out of ideas mm, here. Do you know how we can end it? What if we? Go on, Jam. It's all just on you. Like come together, and we decide to not see color anymore. Um, oh, I think you might have cracked it. Um, Use then, CRISPR to make everyone colorblind. Um, Genius! Oh, amazing. I think that's it. I guess that's 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 it. That's the episode. But what we got to wow. do is a little quick fire quiz. <laughs> bom, 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 bom. Crispy edition. My question is first, what do I start off these quizzes with? Asking what our buzzers uh, are. Well, no, the rules. Tell us the rules, please. That was a quick fire quiz. Jamp, you won. Luke, you lost. He actually didn't. Buzz, so oh, good job. He's good changing job. the he's changing the rules. Nah, here's the rules. So the rules are one. I ask a question, one question between the two of you. The first person to buzz in with the correct answer after I finish asking the question wins. What do they win, Jamp? Nothing. You gosh darn right. So Luke, what is your buzzer? Crisp. Jamp, what is your buzzer? Uh, ooh. Er. <laughs> <laughs> ooh. I'm gonna ooh. discover that. Okay, crisp. Ooh. The, the <laughs> crisp. Ooh. The topic of today's episode. So <clears throat> my question for you today is. What does CRISPR stand for? Oh, oh God, you have no bloody chance. Oh, God. Oh, um, I just can't remember what the, what the C stands for. I can't remember what the C, the R, the I, the S, the P. And, okay, and so the R P stands for uh, palindromic. Mm -hmm. um, the R stands for repeating. No? 
No. No. The first person to get any of the other any of the other letters wins this one. Interspaced. Okay, yeah, well oh, done. It's clustered so regularly interspaced. <laughs> Palindromic. <laughs> Palindromic repeats. Yes, there we go. I've yeah. forgotten it already. It's okay. Okay. Now for another point of nothing. <laughs> oh, repeat what does CRISPR stand for? Uh, I've forgotten it. Crispy, clustered, crispy, uh, uh, clustered, jab, regular, jab, oh. clustered, and then I forgot There's something interspaced, secular. Good enough. Well done. <laughs> you both get a point. <laughs> I don't think I deserve that. <laughs> no, neither do I. <laughs> oh dear me. Well, why don't you head down to our comments and tell us who do you think deserved the win, Jamp or Luke? Not me. Well, pretty much neither of us, to be honest. <laughs> Before we go, we would like to thank all of our patrons and thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday and why not leave us a nice wee comment. You can support the pod at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys or you can find and contact us at SciGuysPod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and uh, SciGuys on TikTok too. Or you can join the Discord and join the community. Why don't you send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com SciGuysPod at gmail.com You can follow me at Noel Curry everywhere. Follow me at Jamkin everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cutforth everywhere. Goodbye. Clustered regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. Woo!